We fly in the twin engine Navajo from Anchorage to Lake Clark, passing by beautiful glaciers and finally reaching this gorgeous turquoise lake, this uh, amazing wilderness, this largest national park of America. And land at Port Allsworth, where three generations of Alaskan pioneers we call our closest friends live and maintain this incredible facility that allows us to fly around this remote wilderness and have close friends that we can meet every year and retell our stories of the last 40 years or so. We get in the jet boat and go into the even more remote wilderness. Well, before we got this enclosed cabin cruiser, we used to do it in an open lawn, open lawn? and we always had bad rides. Oh man, it was a miserable. Yeah, soaked and wet by the time we got there, but we always got our flowers over there. <laughs> Boy, there's something about Ted Stevens passing away, though, huh? That's terrible. Did you know him? Yeah. He would have come back, he said. You're doing a pretty good job, let me tell you. Yeah, no kidding. Wow. This is, this is a Thank great trip across. Jeff. Woo! Woo, yeah! <laughs> Whoa. Oh. Oh. That is rough water. Before we even unpack, in the rain, we decide to take a look at some of the reconstruction effort that Steve and Mark and AJ have been putting into the lodge this entire summer so that it can be permanent and not fall apart and not be destroyed and just be brought up to perfect modern standards despite keeping the ancient historic architecture. It's not been the best summer but for weather, but it's been a good summer. You got a lot done, it looks like. Yeah, it's been but fun. It, the weather this morning looked a heck record, of a record. Yeah, record, record rains this year. I think it's wet and rainy and lousy. <laughs> Other than that, it's good. <laughs> but for the most part, it's up on good foundation. Foundation now, finally. That's the main it just thing. Just needs to be straightened up. <laughs> needs to be straightened a little bit. Yeah. So how long do you think it's going to last now? <laughs> oh, it'll last a hundred years. Fantastic. Uh, the Alaskan way, duct tape and hot glue. You can fix anything with yep, that. Yep. <laughs> the next day the weather turned beautiful and we took a look at some of the finished product of Steve and Mark and AJ's efforts. Steve and his friend AJ, with the brilliant guidance from uh, Mark Mullins, spent the entire summer doing all this work on reconstructing the lodge, all the cabins, even the tool shed which had actually washed away, putting in new foundations so that this historic treasure will basically last indefinitely and not be washed away by the incredible elements in this uh, very remote wilderness. And you can see this incredible Lodge with all the original 75, 90 year old log architecture with indigenous logs that were taken from around the area before it was even a national park. And you can see how we finished the inside so that we have large, open, huge, spacious rooms and over 4,000 square feet. Really beautiful interior in an area that has no city, no services, with our own generator and our own plumbing, our own water supply. We are almost like survivalists out there. Having reviewed the reconstruction at our lodge at Chalitna, we're going to travel down to some other areas of the lake where we've been working on reconstruction of very old historic cabins that various pioneers had built. Can't help but, of course, uh, take out the three-way fly rod wherever we go to enjoy the abundance of grayling. 
uh, that just love to rise and munch on our dry flies uh, in all of these areas where there's cabin reconstruction going on, as far as 60 miles, in fact, away from our home lodge. Here we can see the very rich supply of grayling that we don't keep or eat. We always return them so we can enjoy them and they can enjoy their home. And perhaps we're tormenting them a little bit when we catch them. But this is a chance to really feel in touch with these incredible ancient fish. Uh, the fish are, of the planet are over 550 million years old and to feel in touch with this ancient source of life that brings life really to our wilderness, uh, older than any of the other animals really, and to be feel it on the other end of our almost invisible line, to share our universes at the moment of fly fishing, to, for me is one of the great pleasures of being in the wilderness, though some might perhaps criticize it. It is a beauty getting videos of it. Oh, look at him go. <laughs> Somewhat high. Uh, we're taking a skiff now across this uh, slough to actually look closely at the work that's been done on the Priest Rock cabin uh, to bring it back to its beautiful, pristine character. So if you're clear back 90 feet, you can be pretty sure the forest fire isn't going to get you, is that Well, right? we, the issue is you can get in here and, and hopefully save your building. And generally it'll bl blow through. See, there's no ground vegetation in here or, or brush, so... Yeah. Family room. Let's go. Go, okay. uh, No, it's just this screen that's all weatherwood plywood. But what we're going to do is we're going to cut this hill down so the runoff from here... You as you can see, the pioneer who built this cabin had a very nice view, and he woke up every morning, every day of the year, to look at this. What could be a better life? <laughs> Where'd you say the wood stove is going? Well, there's one in that corner, there's a little... Oh, I see, yeah. yeah. So he had a nice two-room cabin plus a sauna. Yep. And an outhouse. Yep. And he cooked right here. Yep. It is a real treat to go out to Katmai where the salmon, red salmon, are in huge numbers in a large open area where bears from all over the Bristol Bay region come to have their biggest meal of the year in late July and most of August. It's uh, a long this very special creek, which has probably the greatest concentration of grizzly bears anywhere in the world at this time of year, we're able to get very close, within 10 feet of some of these bears, because all they care about at this time is the salmon. They've got plenty of food in the river, and they don't really care much about us. When the salmon spawn, they die and their bodies decompose. And these bears would like to catch them before their bodies decompose, while the meat still tastes really good. But in the meantime, the ones that decompose eventually become the basic protein that becomes the food for the salmon fry when they hatch next year. Here you can see Mama Bear teaching her two little cubs how to go up and down the mountains and how to try to fish for salmon. And some of the scenes are extremely funny because these cute little bears, which in a couple of years will be great big grizzlies themselves, seem so relatively incompetent and completely dependent on Mama. Even sibling rivalry, like <laughs> we see in our human species, takes place in these bear families. And Mama has to interfere to make sure 
that the cubs treat each other fairly. It's frightening sometimes to see the speed at which these bears can immediately attack the salmon. Understanding that within a half a second, this bear could be right on us if he wanted to be. It is not so easy for them to catch the salmon, and so they take advantage of their lightning speed in order to do so. But they look like great, big, huge, clumsy, strong, but clumsy animals, and we don't realize, we always underestimate, that they can run faster than a racehorse. And their speed would mean that this mama bear who's fishing for her cubs could be right upon us within half a second and we could never get away. But at this time of year we can get this close feeling completely safe because there's never really been an incident at this time of year in this area because all that's on their mind at this point is to get their best meal of the year. In late July and in early August they eat so much food that this is the meal that will last them for the rest of the year. Everything else is secondary to the salmon they eat during this one short season when red salmon, the sockeye, come up to spawn. Oh, and look at the sweetness that we see between these two little cubs that are following mama very closely and waiting for her to bring them a great big delicious salmon out of the river which they don't know how to catch yet themselves. The bears sometimes think they see a salmon that they can catch and they speed up very quickly to try to claw them and it is not so easy to do so. Although it looks like it should be easy, it isn't and they have to use all of their skills to be able to catch these salmon. In fact, if the salmon weren't slowed down because they're in their spawning time and ready to die, uh, the bears could probably never catch them very easily. So now we leave the bears to go back to do reconstruction at the lodge and to enjoy Lake Clark. Here, Steve, and Mark and AJ are using a great big caterpillar that they needed to haul heavy things like this dead generator in and out of the cabins and the lodge and to reconstruct the lodge so that it looks just like it must have looked 75 years ago but nonetheless is up to date with modern foundation uh, and built so sturdy that it won't uh, deteriorate. This leaves a lot of uh, old lumber and refuse, which allows us to enjoy a bonfire by a beautiful, incredible rainbow as we rest after a, a big day's work. It's a full rainbow. Tell them to come out. They got to see this. Oh my God, it's a total rainbow. What could be better? We got a bonfire. We got a total rainbow. This is a great picture in the, in the window. I can see you guys reflected in the, wind, in the front window with the bonfire behind you. Mark heads back to Port Allsworth while we enjoy the bonfire and the rainbow in our remote wilderness. Joey makes bread for dinner. We have a great meal, as we always do in this huge, incredible kitchen and enjoy another beautiful morning the next day. This is something pretty spectacular to wake up to. The sun far in the east is just creeping over the mountains and lighting up our cabin and we're getting ready to go in Glen Stinson looking for caribou. How old is this plane? Right, so this is a mid-1940s. Uh, Stinson 108 with uh, it's kind of a souped up version as a 210 horsepower and uh, well pretty much we use it everywhere we can use our super cub and then some places we can't use the cub because the landing gear is a lot better on this plane and uh, it'll obviously hold about hold about two super club cub loads at once so pretty awesome airplane.
And does anybody else in the world have one? I mean, you you remade this whole thing. Yeah, right? there, there are other people that own Stinsons, um, but a lot of them have the old engines and haven't been redone. So this thing has these big uh, seaplane style doors that open up, has the bigger engine, um, a lot bigger wheels on it than most Stinsons have, has a uh, new spars that give you kind of a gross weight increase, a bigger tail, just all kinds of stuff that uh, does make it a make it a better airplane. This year the caribou stayed far away initially from the group and so Steve used his incredible marine commando skills to figure out how to sneak around the mountains and the hills outside of their view and to sneak around behind where they were and then to come into view and herd them uh, toward Joan and Joe and Lysandra so that everybody could have a chance to see them. This was quite a remarkable stalking adventure, but Steve said the caribou were much easier to stalk than the humans. Uh, we're flying back now to Port Allsworth in the Stinson and prepare a great big feast, a big dinner, for our wilderness friends who are going to be coming from all over this wilderness from 50 to 100 miles away uh, to join us as they do every year at our lodge for a major feast. Kind of unexpected, flew in. Bella, did you get my newest video? I did, it was wonderful. Well, I think Bella's my biggest fan though. She really likes them. Yeah. You do a wonderful job. I just listen to you all day long. Back that was well, I tell him. I'll try to stay in touch with the Park Service Research Program down here. And they um, they talk about, oh, we got so many thousands of salmon, millions of salmon, and everything is good. But has any of them ever seen? The Puget River, scarlet for a quarter of a mile with the salmon around. Have they seen Kijik Lake right up behind you here? Have they ever seen that? Literally scarlet, looks like a fried egg for about a hundred yards all the way around the lake. It's scarlet. They don't know what a real run of salmon even looks like. All of our wilderness friends who are not Jewish, nonetheless enjoy our Friday night Jewish Sabbath lighting candles and the celebratory Sabbath dinner on Friday night. Joan lights the candles, which designates the separation of the Sabbath from the rest of the week and reads the special prayer, blessing our Sabbath and our day of rest and thanking God for this gorgeous wilderness home. Thanks for everything, guys. Hey, it was great to meet you, Jack. We'll see you some more. Hey, Helen, Grace. <laughs> when the moon begins to rise just beyond the horizon to the west of Tenalian Mountain, we have the most incredible mirror views just sitting on our porch, waiting for the eventual darkness to come. And it's so mesmerizing that it's just almost impossible to go to sleep until it turns pitch dark. The next morning, uh, Joe and Lysandra shock her parents uh, with a phone call on our satellite phone from the middle of nowhere describing where we are. It's good up here. It's absolutely beautiful, pristine. Nobody um, out in the real wilderness. Uh Lodges in Alaska have classically been fishing and hunting uh, places, but Steve's concept is totally different. To take advantage of the absolute beauty and serenity of this isolated area, to be a perfect idyllic spot for yoga and meditation. And for that purpose, he's building this enormous yoga platform, which has 270 degree views of this entire Lake Clark wilderness. 
a real heavy duty Scrabble game going on here. Very, very, very heavy duty. Steve practices his tightrope walking skills. Quite incredible. But for a mountain climber and a rock climber like Steve, to heighten one's balance to the skill level of a tightrope walker can wind up saving your life someday. So he works on this every day and has the most incredible balance I've ever seen. Do you know that Stevie can walk a tightrope? Did you see this, Joan? At the end of a tough day of fishing and caribou viewing and bear viewing and wonderful yoga, it's fun just to sit on the porch and take a huge view of our surroundings. Hi, Steve. The next morning we get in the boat and take a very long ride way down the lake to another old pioneer cabin reconstruction site that we're working on. Mark is the master cabin builder and overall mechanic and wilderness master uh, that has been teaching us everything we know. And he takes us now to one of his favorite spots, Joe Thompson's old cabin which is an incredible relic of an old pioneer. And Mark's goal is to completely restore this cabin as it originally was. That is so cute. That is so, cute. so you've got to bring that up to snuff. It looks beautiful, actually. We're getting it. This is really something. God, it's too bad we don't have snow over here. Yeah, and he did it, used it for trim here. So he, he doesn't really have any nails. No nails? Little nails in here, but he uses all this this metal here is what's actually holding the cabin together. Oh, you're those, kidding. Those are all those square gas cans that they used to use in the old days. Which metal? Oh, my gosh. That's holding the roof? It's holding this. It's this holding all the, the whole water. thing up. And then the whole roof is those metal gas cans that he sat here cutting. You know? cool. Oh, my he gosh. must not have got the NFL chance. You were up to the mine and he'd go up, you know, every day or whatever it was. And so he was a buddy of Howard and Tish then, huh? Yeah, they're square gas cans that they used to use in the old days to haul fuel out, you know. And he yeah. just tore it up with what? How did he cut this? Well, si he must have had some metal cutting scissors or something. So he wow. cut them all open and, and use them as shingles and stuff. Yeah, and this is a little piece of glass I ordered glass My for gosh, it, so. that's the original door to the cabin. Incredible. Steve is leading us again, along with Glenn Allsworth Jr., along this Funnel Creek area to continue to view these incredible creatures, these great big gigantic brown bears or grizzly bears. They are so big and so potentially ferocious, and yet at this time of year we can get very close to them without any fear as we watch them in their natural lifestyle. Here is an amazing scene of Mama Bear resting with cubs she is nursing. This is after a difficult morning's fishing and the cubs were hungry and she fed them. And meanwhile, all the rest of the bears continue meandering around this incredible spot where it is so relatively much easier for them to catch fish than in the deeper streams. The whole idea, the whole reason for this enormous gathering of brown bear in this particular location is that uh, there are so many red salmon that come up to spawn and it is an extraordinarily wide and shallow area which makes it relatively easy for them to catch the fish. There's mama bear chasing after a red salmon she absolutely wants to get for those babies. The babies just watch as she finally pounces on this red salmon, kills it and picks it up to take it back to them to eat. Meanwhile now we're up on the uh, top of the slope 
and bears even come up on top as we look down below. Uh, this scene just shows that although that it is not really that easy for the bears to catch the salmon. We finally hike back uh, the long route to the very small lake that we're able to land on and it's time to fly back to the lodge. On the last day that Joan and I and Steve and Lysandra were at the lodge, we decided to take one more trip in the morning out to Priest Rock, my favorite spot, where an incredibly still reflection on Lake Clark because there was no wind, but beautiful, creative cloud formations like I've never seen before. And we take this just idyllic journey uh, through it is uh, mystical scenery, really, uh, to Priest Rock to go fishing again for grayling. That is Priest Rock with this reflection in the calm Lake Clark of the pine trees behind it and we pull into the little harbor, the little slough that this pioneer had used for a cabin site, and I have one more incredible morning of fly fishing for grayling. I love to feel the wildness of one of these trout that rises to catch my fly, and to feel that connection with the wild until I finally bring him in closer so that uh, we can let him go back free into the pond. It's what John Knieper calls sensory overload. Oh! You see him jump? Whoa! Okay, we'll take that out and we'll send you back. Okay, buddy. Look at that beautiful gear. As we return back to Anchorage and from there back to St. Louis and San Francisco and the big city life, the life that we left to find spiritual peace here in this incredible wilderness, we think about Steve's dream which is to bring the spirituality of this amazing wilderness where there are hardly any human beings for over 200 miles of no roads and five and a half million acres of untouched national park wilderness to create a yoga and meditation type of retreat so that people that are not necessarily outdoorsmen can live in this outdoors wilderness feel the spiritual touch with the infinite, practice their yoga, their meditation, and consider over again what it is that is most important about life and what they want to contribute to life and what they want to get out of life. That's what his dream is for our Wilderness Lodge in Alaska. <laughs>